paper right here by uh, Bebchak. Uh, Bebchak is from Harvard University, so this is a, you know, he's a big name in corporate finance. And he finds that actually uh, it's not a good idea to have a powerful CEO because he finds that when you have a more powerful CEO, then firm performance is not uh, as good as it would be if you had a weaker CEO. Okay. So this is what they find. Strong CEO power is associated with lower firm value and lower accounting profitability. You can think of this as, a, it's almost like a, in, in politics you may have a, a dictator, right, who, who is controlling everything, or you may have a more democratic leader who is listen, who is listening to uh, many people uh, before he makes a decision. Yep. The studies that you have there, is their definition of powerful CEO the same as yours? Yes. Or is, well, I guess the question I have is your definition was focused on the management team. Right. As opposed to the relationship between the CEO and board of directors. Exactly, yes. It's the, it's the power inside the top executive team, the management team. And we are using the same exact definition. I'll explain to you how we compute the, uh, yeah. How is power measured? Very good question. In about five minutes, I'm going to talk about it. So I'll explain it much more. So the theory is, if strong CEO power is not good, why is it not good? Well, there's a link to the uh, to the agency conflict. You know that the CEO technically is supposed to protect the interests of the stockholders, right? Because he's acting as an agent to the stockholders. Obviously, every agent, not every agent, is uh, is uh, honest, and he doesn't know. They, they don't always protect the interests of the stockholders. So you may have a situation where the CEO thinks so much about himself and not so much about the stockholders, and that's why we may have this situation where we have an agency conflict, and the CEO may not always take actions that maximize uh, stockholders' benefit. So the next question is, we have established that there's a negative relationship between CEO power and firm A. What we don't know is, what is the mechanism? What is the channel? Why? Why is there a negative relationship there? Why is it not good to have a CEO? Uh, why is it not good to have a powerful CEO? What is the, what is the channel of, of uh, what is the mechanism through which powerful CEOs reduce firm A? And my paper is kind of related to this question. Well, my hypothesis is when you have a powerful CEO, he may not always adopt the best dividend policy. Uh, he may adopt a suboptimal dividend policy. Okay. Uh, but before I go further, I know that some of you may not be in finance, so let me just give you a little background about dividend policy here. Uh, essentially, when your company has a profit, right? If your company is profitable, what can you do with the profit? Basically, you have two options. Either you reinvest the profit, reinvestment, you reinvest the profit into the company, you invest in more projects, or you can distribute the profit.
basic concept behind dividend policy. Okay. Now, my argument is, if you have a powerful CEO, the CEO may not adopt the best dividend policy. Obviously, when you have this corporate profit train, as, as a CEO, would you rather distribute the profit or would you rather reinvest the profit to the company? In theory, in theory, what you have to do is, if you don't think the company can reinvest the profit and get sufficient return, then you should distribute the money to the stockholders so the stockholders can invest the money themselves. That's the theory. Yeah. In reality, can you imagine if you have a lot of profit there, you might want to keep most of the profit inside the company so you have more control over the, over the money, right? So that's what we call the free cash flow. When you have this free cash flow, then uh, you don't want to pay, pay out, uh, you don't want to have uh, high dividends because you want to keep most of the money in the company so the CEO can have more control. Second, can you imagine if you if you pay dividends regularly? So that means you're gonna run out of cash uh, earlier. When you run out of cash earlier, what happens? You have to go to the stock market again to issue new equity, right? Every time you go to the stock market to issue new, e new equity, that's a lot of uh, scrutiny, a lot of paperwork you have to do, uh, investors, regulators are going to scrutinize your actions, right? So you don't want you don't want that kind of monitoring because uh, it's going to be very uh, uh, time consuming, and if you do something uh, questionable, then it's going to show up when you go to the stock market because a lot of people are going to be looking at your actions. So my argument is, yes. You have a question. In other words, you're saying the presumption is on the right side up there that. that those dividends aren't often coming from the profits that are sustainably there year in, year out, that, that some years they don't have that and then they have to raise capital in the- Yes, that's a very good point. Dividend. That's a very good point. Uh, one thing about dividend policy is that it's sticky. So as soon as you have this level of dividends, you have to maintain the same level of dividends. So you're right, even though sometimes they run out of money, they want to maintain the same level of dividends, they have to raise additional capital, yes. That's true. So this is what I just mentioned here. A dividend policy is sticky. As soon as you establish a pattern of dividends, then you have to follow the pattern. Every time you have a reduction in dividends, then you have a negative reaction from the stock. So um, one hypothesis is that because dividend policy is sticky, so the CEO may not be able to exercise his judgment that much because he has to follow the pattern that has been established for many years, right? So maybe the, the CEO doesn't really matter that much. Well, what is optimal dividend um, level? Because you said the best dividend policy how do you define, how do you measure the, the optimal? And Theoretically, is there any difference between the dividend policy and the cash holding uh, decision? The right. uh, dividend decision and the cash holding decision? In theory, this is what, what it is. In theory, uh, if you don't believe you have investment projects that would give adequate return, you have to make a comparison between what the company can invest in and what the stockholders can invest in. And if you don't think you can get more return than the stockholders would get by themselves, then you should distribute the profit. On the other hand, if you have a lot of profitable projects, then you should invest in those projects. So that's the theory, that's the optimal. So the level of interest rates are there? Yes, part of it. So, this hypothesis is saying that, well, maybe CEO power doesn't really matter because uh, you can imagine if you come in as a new CEO, 
and the company has established a specific dividend pattern for the past 10 years, then that's not much you could do, right? You have to follow the pattern. So in that sense, then the CEO doesn't really matter there. So to summarize, I have two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is what we call the agency hypothesis. And it says that powerful CEOs favor not paying dividends because they want to control the free cash flow. They want to have more control over the free cash flow. And that's why they don't want to pay dividends. On the other hand, the second one is what we call the irrelevance hypothesis. Basically, it says that well, the CEO doesn't really matter because they have to follow this specific pattern that has been established for many, many years. So we're going to test this hypothesis, uh, these two hypotheses. This is the question that uh, Shemiga just asked a few minutes ago. When you talk about power, how do you measure power quantitatively, right? It's such an abstract uh, notion. Well, I follow the same methodology as uh, that track, uh, 2011. That's what we call the CPS, or CEO pay slice. And this is the definition here. It's the CEO's total compensation as a fraction of the combined total compensation of the top five executives. So basically, when you look at a company, right, you select the top five executives, and you see how much they make collectively top five, and you see what proportion uh, the, 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 the compensation of the CEO represents what proportion of the total of the top five. Let me show you one example. So the idea is uh, the higher the CPS, the more powerful the CEO is. Example, you know this company, Alco, Alco? Uh, they produce uh, what do, they, what do they make of aluminum here? Mm -hmm. The top five executives in this company are the following. The first person is the CEO. You see, it's not an accident that I selected someone with a PhD. <laughs> I wanted to show that, you know, we got a lot of criticisms that in academics you are, you are isolated from reality and you don't know how to run a company. This is an example of someone who has a PhD and he's a CEO as well. So this is not a coincidence here. Uh, his name is Klaus uh, Kleinfeld. And this is how much he makes. This is in, in thousands. So I think he made, in 2012, he made uh, what, 11 million in total compensation. Uh, and the, the other four people, this is how much they made last year. 2.9, 2.9, 3.2, 2.3. The total top five would be, 23 million. And then you, you compute how much of the, uh, what percentage is represented by the CEO compensation. So it's 11.7 divided by 23.3, so it's about 50%. Can you imagine it, it accounts for 50% of the total then, John? PJ, is that a measure of wealth or is it a measure of power? Because when I think of pow power, Power is about influence, and you, when you started your presentation, you talked about the decisions that are made at the, uh, the top management board. People who are in the top management teams, and so a powerful CEO would be most dominant and exert most influence to initiate changes to the strategy and so forth. So um, just trying to make sense out of the connect, the correlation between the salary as a measure of this idea of power. Right. Uh, I think John has made a very good point. And the problem is, power is not observable. Strictly speaking, power is unobservable. In finance, we don't want something unobservable. We want something that we can measure. And compensation happens to be observable. This is public information. So the idea is we try to measure something unobservable with something observable. So we use this as a proxy for CEO power. Yeah. Okay, I got a question about that as well, about proxy, but I also have a question about the CPS, uh, using CPS as a measuring device. How has, have they gone, how, how far back has CPS gone back to, to uh, 
compare the CEO pay compared current current period versus the 1980s, for instance. Right. The data is available starting in 1992, so uh -huh. we have data going back to 1992. Uh -huh. So it goes back 20 years. I guess I guess I would query that there's been a tremendous difference, a tremendous change in CEO compensation over the last 10 or 15 years. That's a good point. Good Very point. much of it related to equity compensation, versus cash compensation, and performance-based compensation. Right. And if you go back to earlier periods, I would, I would posit that the CEOs were much more powerful back then because they just weren't answerable to them. The boards were not in Good point. So, I guess I would question CPS as a true proxy for CEO power. Right. Uh, one comment that I would like to make in response to that is that it is true that uh, executive compensation has been increasing. But don't forget, we have five people in, ex in the executive team, and all of them have been affected by the same factors. So the compensation of the CEO has been increasing, but the compensations of the other executives have been increasing too. So when you look at you know this fraction, then uh, that could account for some of the uh, variation over time. George? Yeah, just a clarification question. So, did that include all the uh, changing wealth since you know in the literature how big man uh, and Jason Murphy has this big uh, argument on uh, how to measure a CEO composition? Is it the wealth or the standard composition itself? So, uh, so, did that include the uh, options, yeah. uh, stocks? It includes uh, everything salary, bonus long-term incentive plans, uh, options. Everything. So how about the change in stock, stock price? Uh, they use, they, they make some assumptions, and they use the Black and Show, Black Show's uh, model to estimate the value of the stock options. Well, I have a question. The, the pattern, to me, can be interpreted like uh, the other four guys are weak. That's true, yeah. Now, Think about the other another pattern. If the other four guys are strong, yeah. and you will see a very small pay slice, right? Right. So to me, there's a there's a noise in this proxy. But it's, it's the same. If either you say the CEO is strong and he dominates the other four guys, or you say that the other four guys are weak, it's, it's you know it doesn't make much difference because you you are measuring the, the, the power of the CEO relative to the other four people, right? So one of them has to be strong, the other group has to be weak. So it's I'm not sure I want to say that this is a measure of power, but just a measure of pace wise. Mm -hmm. Actually, I know that I, I was skeptical too when I first saw it. Let me show you some evidence later because uh, there is some more evidence that this is a reasonable measure of power. In the beginning, I was skeptical too, but uh, I have become convinced later. So I'll, I'll show you some evidence. Well, interesting. Uh, in the year 2011, yeah. Journal of Finance has another paper about CEO power. Yeah. They use different proxy. So probably you can take a look at that paper and right. do some robustness check. That's true. That's true. I know that paper. Another example here, IBM. <coughs> the CEO is David Sachs. Uh, David Sachs is Michael Terry Duke. And in 2012, he made about $20 million right here. And the other four people in the top executive team, uh, 9.5, 11.2, uh, 6.6, 1.4. The total is about, this is the total, right? And the COK slice is 33%. Okay. So what does it tell us? It is 33%. What does it tell us? That's a good point. What is the interpretation? The interpretation, the interpretation is this. Michael Duke, the CEO of IBM, relative to the previous example, Mr. Kleinfeld and Alpo, it looks like Mr. Kleinfeld is more powerful in his company than Michael Duke in IBM because, because Kleinfeld, his CPS is 50%, and the other one is 33%. So according to this measure, uh, Mr. Kleinfeld is more powerful inside the company than Mr. Duke inside IBM. But still, in the in the second case, that guy has little influence in the management team, but he may still has the power to influence board of directors. Uh, that's true, because this is the management team. It doesn't include the board of directors. 
Right, so he has a good point just now. Also, couldn't that just be a comment on the uh, competitiveness of the employment market within that industry? There's going to be a lot more competition for IBM executives than there's going to be for Alcoa executives. That's a good point. Uh, yes, but the other executives, not just the CEO, the vice presidents, they are subject to the same factors inside the industry, right? So, what, what, which other executive? I'm like, if you, if you look at these four people, right? Right. They are subject to the same competition in the same industry, right? When you there, hire there might be, there might be a lot. There might be a lot of uh, opportunities for them to leave IBM. Right. And they need to be paid to stay. That's a good point. That's a good point. So. Um, that, that's an industry difference between IBM and Alcoa. Right. Related to that, are you looking at one company over? of time or uh, cross-section of industry? It's a panel data set, so we have cross-sectional time series. So we have both cross-sectional and time series. So for each company, we have many years, and for each year, we have many companies. It's panel data. Uh, this was actually mentioned by someone here just a few minutes back. Uh, actually, if this can probably be some way uh, combined with if the C is a member of the board, I think that you can give some yeah. cross validation as to the power because I would think, of course I'm not a finance expert, but I would think that if a CEO is also a member of the board, has more power than a CEO who does, is not a member of the board. That's true, and that could be controlled for in the regression analysis. You could have this dummy variable and you can control for that in the regression all, analysis. All of these CEOs are going to be on the board. Mm -hmm. some, of, some of them may not be the chairman. Right, right, that's true. Sometimes we need a CEO and chairman of the board, but not always. Okay, now I would like you to make a comparison. Maybe you can give me your, uh, maybe you can guess. Southwest Allies, the CEO is, his name is Gary Kelly. And Walt Disney, the CEO is Robert Iger. Who do you think is more powerful? Do you think Gary Kelly is more powerful? In his company, then Robert Iger in Walt Disney, Iger. or the other way around? Iger. 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 Anyone saying Iger is more powerful? Anyone saying the other the other person? Why do you think Iger is more powerful? What I, what's the, what's I the, do not know what the power means here. Right. <laughs> okay. Let me refresh. Let me refresh the let me refresh the question. Who has the higher CEO pay slice? Who has the higher CPS? To be to be more specific. I thought I just remember seeing something in the press about his pay package. That's all. So you think it's, it's Iger, right? Well, let's see. Southwest, 29.65%. Walt Disney, 60%. Oh. You are correct. You are correct. Uh, actually, Robert Iger is much more powerful inside his company than Gary Kelly inside his, uh, inside his Southwest Amazon. You can imagine that there are five people in the top executive team, right? And if you have an equal distribution, each one should account for 20%, right? But you can see that for Robert Iger, his compensation accounts for 60% of the total. That's how, how much influence 